Well, today we're going to start with a series on prayer, and we're going to call this series, we're entitling it, A House of Prayer. A House of Prayer. You might recognize that phrase, a house of prayer, it's from the words of Jesus. In Matthew 21, he, he came into the temple, he came into the, the church, if you will, and the church was evolving into something it was not intended to be. And Jesus entered the temple and he saw it, it had become a marketplace for people to buy and sell. We don't see Jesus get, get angry a whole lot in scripture, but in this moment, I, I think I could say quite confidently that there was some righteous anger building up in Jesus. And he flipped over those, those tables and said, this is not how my house is supposed to be. And he says, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer. It will be called a house of prayer. And this place, first and foremost, we need to make sure this place, this church building, is a house of prayer. Amen. It's not a house of production. It's not a house of programs. It's a house of prayer. I love a quote from Francis Chan from his book, Letters to the Church. He said, if prayer isn't vital to your church, then your church isn't vital. Think about that for a second. If you can go along with how church is going in your programs and you don't take time for prayer, it's not a necessity, your church is not vital in the grand schemes of what God is doing. Amen. You're not desperate enough to see God move, just relying on your own strength. And so I want us as a church, us as individuals, to be grounded in prayer. So through this series, we're going to take our time learning how we can individually and we as a church can grow in our prayer life. We started with the basics last week, and today's message is entitled, The Prayer Template. The Prayer Template. Don't you love when you have to create something, you need to make something, and there's already a template to get you started? It's like, I gotta, I gotta put together a resume for this application. Oh, guess what? There's a template for that. I can just put in that template, and I can fill in my information that I need to. You're creating a, a letterhead, a formal document, whatever it is. Starting with a template helps you to get started. Now, can you create it without the template? Can you work without a template? Yes. It's supposed to help you. It's not telling you everything that you have to say or do in that template. We're going to look at the template that Jesus gives us. He sets us up with to learn how to pray. And again, Jesus starts with our Father, hallowed be your name. We talked about that last week. Let's look at what he says in the next verse after that. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. He then says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And this is certainly, it remains in the same theme from last week. Why we said <coughs> prayer should start with focusing on God, not focusing on us. So Jesus is saying, your kingdom come, God. Your will be done on earth. And it's not because God is egotistical. He, he actually cares about us more than anyone else could. But what prayer does is it changes our perspective to see God's kingdom as greater than anything that we're dealing with in this kingdom. And our first point today, we're going to start right into it. Number one, prayer is seeking for what God wants, not what I want. Prayer starts with seeking God for what He wants, not what I want. Prayer is not asking God to give me what I think that I want, what I think I need. It's asking God to give me what He knows that I need. And there's a lot of reasons why we don't always get the answer to prayer that we're looking for. And I think one of the main reasons is that sometimes we're praying for the wrong thing. And so what Jesus is doing is he's trying to proactively tell us that instead of asking first for what we want, will you align your prayer and saying your kingdom come and your will be done first? He says your kingdom come, meaning calling on the reign of God's kingdom here on earth. That, that's what we need more than anything, right? Prayer is seeking for what God wants, not what I want. And I promise you, promise you, you are going to want what God has for you. A lot of times we, we think we know what we want, 
And fortunately, God in his grace and wisdom holds back the things that we are asking for. Just like a good parent, you know when to give your, your kids pizza and junk food and sweets and when that's enough and you need to give them something that will be good for their health. You know when they need to go to bed, when they ask to stay up all night, when they ask to play video games all day. A good parent doesn't say, sure, just do whatever you want all day. Stay up as late as you want. No, a good parent knows the limits of the children. Our father knows what we need, when to say yes, and when to say no. Looking back at some of the prayers that I've prayed over the year, I thought, I'm glad there's a few times that God said no. I'm glad that he said no to things. He might say no to a job that you think would be best for you. No to a relationship that you're looking for. I promise God has something way better. When he says no, it is for the best reason. God's kingdom here on earth. And we sing songs about that, right? We sing songs praying for God's kingdom to come. What, what did John the Baptist say would happen when the kingdom of heaven would be here? Look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. John the Baptist said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Our world needs the kingdom of heaven because we need to repent. We need to turn away from our sin and turn towards the gift of salvation and the freedom that only Jesus can provide. Amen. Now, in our flesh, we want to stay in our comfort, right? It's comfortable to be in sin. It's a lot easier to live the way that we want to. But that's why it's such a dangerous prayer when we surrender our will and we say, we say, God, I don't want my comforts. I'm going to choose your kingdom. God, I don't want my preferences. I want your power. God, it's not about my wishes. It's about your will being done. That's the power of of a surrendered life in prayer, saying, God, your will be done. Calling on the kingdom of heaven for repentance. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Sometimes when I'm praying that, I like to personalize that part. You might have heard me say, your will be done in Marysville as it is in heaven. You can personalize that for your own house. Your will be done in my household. Your will be done, God, in my city. Your will be done in my mind, in my will, in my emotions, in my life. God, your will be done. And it's easy to pray that when things turn out your way. I want to challenge you today. Can you ask God your will be done when it's hard to do the thing that he's asking you to do? When it goes against what your will is? Jesus was approaching his arrest and crucifixion. And he went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. Read what he said to God in Matthew 26. Verse 39, he said, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus came before his father and he asked earnestly for him to take away this cup. Meaning take away this responsibility of going to the cross and dying. And Jesus, he came to earth knowing what his purpose was. He knew what he was going to have to do and yet he still asked God, if it's possible, let this not be the option. God, can you find another way? We do this ourselves, right? God, please find another way. Please, do I have to break up with this person? Do, do I have to uh, find a new job? Do I have to start over? Do I have to forgive that person? Do I have to do that surgery? God, can you find another way? Nevertheless, Jesus said, but not my will. Your will be done. It's tough when God is tugging on us to make a change and do something difficult. But we know that God's will is the best thing for us. And it's a prayer saying, God, your will be done that shows full trust in him. 
It's full confidence that God will watch over you. Praying that prayer aligns yourself to God's will in trust. Let's look at the next verse of the Lord's Prayer. Verse 11, it says, Give us this day our daily bread. Finally, we're going to talk about something good that we want, right? Matt tried to starve us two weeks ago talking about, about fasting, and now we can talk about give us the bread. Give me the Texas Roadhouse bread. Give me the honey oat loaves from Cheesecake Factory, right? We can pray this prayer to God. A lot more amens, a lot more people happier than they were earlier today. Not only are we allowed to ask these things from God, we are encouraged to ask God to give us our daily bread. The second point today is that prayer is a daily conversation, not a weekly check-in. It's a daily conversation. Notice what Jesus is saying here. He says, give us this day. Well, if we're encouraged to pray this day for today's bread, what about tomorrow? What about the weekend? Jesus is saying, pray daily to God. It's a daily conversation that we need to pray. Prayer is not a weekly check-in. It's not saying, hey God, I'm here again today at church. I came in. Uh, this week is going to be a little bit rough. I, I've been struggling with a boss. Can you give me self-control? Can you give me wisdom? Thanks God. I'll check back in with you next week. I'll see you then. That's not what our prayer life should look like. Later in the series, we're going to look at, the Bible says, praying without ceasing. What does that mean? Here, Jesus is saying, pray today for what you need today, and pray tomorrow for what you're going to need tomorrow. Because <clears throat> your daily bread might change from day to day. You might have a different need tomorrow than you did today. Daily, give us our daily bread. In the Old Testament, the Israelites were wandering the wilderness before the promised land. And God was sending them manna from heaven. Bread from heaven to sustain them in the wilderness. And the instructions he was giving them is that each day go out and get as much as you need for that day. Now some of the people thought they were really smart. And they said, oh, I know God didn't say this, but I'll go get out enough for tomorrow as well. And the next day they would open up the, the pantry and look in there. And the bread was moldy. Maggots, they couldn't eat it. They had to go out each day. I wonder, you know, I think God's a pretty capable, powerful God. Couldn't he create a bread that they could have that would be good for days, weeks, months, years? I mean, he's God, right? He could do this. It wasn't outside of his ability and his power. In fact, when it was the Sabbath day, the day before, they were instructed to go get enough for today and for tomorrow, the Sabbath day. Because they, God didn't want them to work on the Sabbath. They were to stay home and focus on him. Again, there were some bright people in the group that said, I'll go out and see if God's got food for me on, on the Sabbath day. God had to be up there like, what do I have to do to get them to listen to my instructions? So God clearly could make bread that was good for multiple days in a row. It wasn't a matter of his ability or inability. It was our ability to trust him each and every day for what we would need. It was to keep us in a constant relationship and a conversation with God. The best relationships in your life are the ones that you have with people each day, multiple times a week, not just once a month checking in with them. How close do you want to be to God? Pray the prayer, give us this day our daily bread. It's a daily conversation. That's how relationship works. He loves to provide for you. I know I said last week, I was saying, focus more on God before you focus on what you need. But don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. God loves to hear from you. God is waiting to hear about your daily needs. He loves to answer you. He loves to meet your needs. He loves to provide for you and give you what you need in your physical needs, in your financial needs, in your relationship needs, in your family needs. You can ask God to fulfill your daily needs. When I was in college attending The Ohio State University, um, I had a daily need each time I would commute down 
to campus. And that was to try to find a parking spot. Fall semester, or quarter, whatever it was back then, there's a bunch of new freshmen coming to campus. Everyone's driving around trying to find a parking spot. I had to arrive an hour, two hours before my class just to find a parking spot. And I was so naive because I was excited. I just received, uh, I think they called it like the C parking pass. That was for all students, okay? Before that, I just had the West Campus. I had to park all the way to the West Campus, take a bus in. But now, in theory, I could park right next to Fisher College of Business and go right into my classes. But yet, I was every day trying to find a parking spot. Every day, God knew where, where to meet me and when he would hear from me. It was when I needed a parking spot. <laughs> every day, I'm going in there and asking God, please, this day, give me my daily parking spot. <laughs> and it's funny because sometimes we get the wrong idea about prayer. And we actually use prayer as a method to avoid action. Let me tell you something. If prayer does not lead you to action, you might be doing it wrong. You see, I can't just pull into the parking area and say, God, where is it? Where's the spot? I thought you were going to give it to me. I don't see it right in front of me. No, I had to look. I had to search. I might have to drive to different areas. There had to be action on my part to go along with prayer. It got so bad. One time, I was like stalking people, walking around the area like, are you going to your car? Are you going to your car? Can I take your spot? And one time, I drove a person to their spot so that they would get out, and I would stay there until they backed out and left, and I could take a spot. Prayer should lead us to action. It's, it's a working together relationship. We pray for our financial needs, but are you going to just quit your job and stop working? I hope not. We pray for our exams and our classes that you're going through, but you need to keep studying. You might be praying for your significant other, your spouse, that one day will be your spouse, but that doesn't mean you stop working on you and becoming more spiritually and emotionally healthy. Is anybody listening today? Prayer should lead us to action. If prayer does not lead us to action, we might be doing it wrong. Let's look at one more verse from the Lord's Prayer. After he says, give us our daily bread, verse 12, he says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And I'm thankful that God gives us the opportunity to pray for our needs, to pray for our forgiveness. It says, forgive our debts. It's not about owing someone money, but sin is a debt that has to be paid. And thankfully, Jesus took up that payment by living a sinless life, dying on the cross to pay that debt. I think of the, the hymn, Jesus paid it all, right? All to him I owe. In a little bit, we're going to close with communion and, and remembering the sacrifice of Jesus. When Jesus went to the cross, he, he went there for us, but I actually want to take a moment and look at the second part of that verse, where he says, we also have forgiven our debtors. I love receiving the forgiveness of God. I love talking about how God forgave us. He hasn't held on to anything that we've done wrong, any of the shameful, dishonoring things that we've done, but yet we sometimes hold on to the things that others have done against us. I feel pretty confident that we've all had to forgive someone for something that they've done to us. If you're here today and you've never been hurt by someone, you've never been offended by another person, count yourself blessed. Right? That hasn't happened, right? We've all been offended by people. We've all been hurt by people. Things happen in life, unfortunately. And, and I hate to say, I'm someone that I've hurt other people. I've offended other people. I've, you know when you, you said something and right away you're like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I said that. That was so dumb. That's not what I meant. I did not mean to be hurtful like that. And I can't take back what I just said. Mm -hmm. But I can't ask for forgiveness for what I just said. And forgiveness, both asking for forgiveness and forgiving others is one of the hardest prayers that we can pray to God. 
but it's also the one, one of the most powerful prayers. Because oftentimes we think that when we withhold forgiveness from someone else, we're keeping that power. But we're actually doing just the opposite. We have no freedom because we continue to think about what that person did to us, what they said to us. The definition by psychologists is giving forgiveness is a conscious choice to release feelings of resentment or vengeance towards someone who has hurt you, regardless of whether they deserve forgiveness. Forgiveness is actually less about them and more about you. Because you're letting go of that control that they've had on your thoughts and, and your mind. It's acknowledging the pain. It's not ignoring it. It's not avoiding it. It's addressing it and then moving on. And I read a book recently by Chad Beach, pastor in L.A. His book called Worried About Everything Because I Pray About Nothing. And he has a great section about what forgiveness does not mean. I, I want to share with you what forgiveness does not mean. Forgiveness does not mean that you no longer feel pain or loss. It doesn't mean that you don't seek justice. That you don't make sure you are safe from further harm. It doesn't mean that you can let that aggressor back into your life or give them control. And it certainly does not mean there are no consequences for what they've done. Forgiveness is giving you the power to say, that thing is not going to hold control over me. And I have to be very straightforward here. Because forgiveness for Christians is not an option. This is not a, okay, do it if you want to, but if not, it's okay, you can hold on to those things. No, let me show you what Jesus says right after the Lord's Prayer, verse 14. It says, for if you forgive others their trespasses... Your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. I wish today I could tell you, yeah, it's optional. Do with, do with it as you will. But that would be wrong, and I'd be leading you the wrong direction. We all need the forgiveness of God. We all need to forgive others in our life. And our third and final point as we close Praying for forgiveness is praying for freedom. If you forgive others, your Heavenly Father will forgive you. Forgiveness gives you freedom from the offender and freedom in your spiritual life. Just like any command that Jesus gives us, it is for our benefit. It's because Jesus wants us to let go of the personal hurt so that you can walk into your future unhindered by the offense of others. And it would be hypocritical for you to ask God to forgive you your sins, but yet be unwilling to forgive someone who has sinned against you. There's freedom in forgiveness. And you might say, Matt, you don't understand what they said to me. You don't understand what they've done to me. No, no one gets what I'm going through. Has anyone thought that before? Maybe you've said it. When I think those thoughts, I think of the words of Jesus when he prayed to God. Jesus, who was completely innocent throughout his life, right? We believe Jesus did not sin. He lived a sinless life. Did nothing wrong. And yet he was beaten. He was arrested. He was mocked. His own people rejected him. His own people sent him to the cross guilty instead of a man that was also set before them who was clearly guilty. And what did Jesus do in response to how people treated him and falsely accused him? He said this in Luke chapter 23. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. If that moment is not the epitome of the unfailing love of Jesus, if there was a moment that the love of Jesus would have failed while he walked this earth, I think it would have been that moment. To be on the cross, looking out at the crowd, those people, 
It's very nice for Jesus to say they don't know what they do, because I would have felt like they know exactly what they've done. They chose to put me in this spot. And unfortunately, in life, people do all sorts of terrible things, right? I don't need to give you examples of it. And we'll say, man, I can't believe someone would do something like that. What a terrible thing. And my first reaction is, I think I know exactly how they would do it. Without a relationship with Jesus, we are all selfish people. We don't care what we do as long as it helps us and benefits us. We don't care what it does to others. And unfortunately, I think, I know, I get it. I know why that person did that. They're hurt and they don't have the love of Jesus. But it also hurts when we're offended by someone else who claims to be a Christian. Now, we don't do that, right? Never been offended by a Christian. Don't know what that is like. Now, we've all been hurt by other Christians. And it's unfortunate. Sometimes we acknowledge it. We hope there's an awareness there to ask for forgiveness. But we know forgiveness is not based on their feelings. It's based on our willing to let go of that control and have freedom and say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they've done. It's amazing that in that moment on the cross, Jesus gave the best recommendation. He said the best things. He gave the best endorse, endorsement in the circumstances, saying, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. We're to ask God for forgiveness and to forgive others. I'm going to ask you, the next time you think of what someone has said or they've done to you, how they've hurt you, can you say, God, please forgive them? They don't know what they've done. Can that be your response to an offense? A response to offense is a, a prayer. Crying out to God. Jesus, forgive them. I promise you, this, this moment of forgiveness, this prayer, gives you the freedom that you need. This is more for you. That other person may never know that you asked for forgiveness for them. You're not supposed to go up to them and later be like, I forgave you. Don't worry about it. I'm over it. That's not how it's supposed to work. It's a connection between you and God. It's in your heart. Worship team, you can come up as we get ready to close. We're going to take time and move into communion as the worship team leads us in the song. And if you didn't get communion elements, could you go ahead and raise your hand? We'll have people bring those up. Keep your hand up high so we make sure that we get the communion elements to you. I'm not asking you today to, to stand up during worship in the song. I actually want you to remain seating because I, I want you to take a moment and pray for forgiveness of our sins we're supposed to before we take communion the bible instructs us to examine ourselves examine our hearts think about the week that you've had think about the things that you've said or you've done the thoughts that you've had as they lead us in worship we're going to take a moment and all of us, in our own way to God, ask for forgiveness of our sins. But before we do that, following the template that Jesus laid out in the Lord's Prayer, forgiving those who have hurt us, I think it's intentional that Jesus said it in the Lord's Prayer, and then he said it again right after the Lord's Prayer. Because he knows it's one of the hardest prayers that we can pray. But there is power and there is freedom and forgiveness. And so I want to pray with you. Could you go ahead and bow your head, or close your eyes for a moment here. If you're here today and you've been struggling with an offense, you've been struggling with giving forgiveness, I want to pray with you. I, want, I believe God is here to release some people from hurts, whether it was from last Sunday or it was weeks ago or months or years ago. I believe that God can give you freedom through the forgiveness of others. I hope I don't need to remind you that that list of what forgiveness does not mean. It does not mean that you let them back into your life. It does not mean any of those things. It simply means that you're at peace with God. It doesn't even mean that you'll no longer feel hurt about it. But what it means to me is that when, I, when those thoughts come back into my head, when I begin to get angry and tense and, and clench my teeth, I think, God, forgive them. They don't know what they've done to me. 
They don't know how they've hurt me. And if that's you today, I want to just keep you in mind as we pray. Would you lift up your hand and say, man, I need help to forgive those that have hurt me. Yes, I see that hand. I see that hand. Yep. Yep. Let's pray together, church. God, I pray right now. We thank you that we have received the forgiveness of God. That you cleansed us in the blood of Jesus when you went to the cross. Hallelujah, we've accepted the grace and the mercy of God. Now help us to extend it to others. Now there are people in this room that have gone through horrible, difficult, challenging things in their life. Maybe there are nights where they can't, they struggle to sleep because they think about it, they dream about it. Things trigger them so quickly, so easily. God, I pray, would they allow forgiveness to wash over their hearts. And when they think those thoughts, they would be able to say, Father, please forgive them. They don't know what they've done. I want to walk in freedom. I want to walk in forgiveness. We thank you for this forgiveness. I pray that healing is in the room right now. It's touching hearts. It's changing minds as we focus more on you than on our problem. We focus more on our Savior than the situation. So right now, we take a moment as well to ask for forgiveness of our debts, our sin. We remember the cross right now. Bring to memory the things that we've done wrong because we, we don't want to just ask for forgiveness today. We want to ask for repentance. We want to 